Welcome to part two of the greatest NBA players to never score 50 points in a single game. Now, once again, just like part one, these are going to be some very unexpected names on this list. So without further ado, let's get into it with Gary Payton. Gary Payton was a part of an elite duo alongside Sean Kemp throughout the 90s. And while he was best known for his playmaking and elite defense, he was still a very good scorer. However, despite being one of the top guards of that era, he was never able to score more than 50 in a game. Shockingly, Peyton's career high came at the age of 32 against the Minnesota Timberwolves on March 4th, 2001. He came out of the gates hot, making 7 out of his 9 shots in the first quarter for 14 points. He then followed that up with a very respectable 8 points in the second, not sitting for a single second in the first half. Peyton played the entirety of the third quarter as well and continued to put up points on the Timberwolves, scoring 11 in the third. In the fourth, he upped his minutes on the night to a total of 48, and while he only shot 3 for 8 from the field in the fourth quarter, he still added on 9 more points. Despite Peyton's 42-point effort in regulation, it still was not enough for the Supersonics to pull away with the victory and the game was sent to overtime. In OT, Peyton did not take a single shot from the field but did sink two free throws, ending his night with a career-high 44 points. Along with his 44 points, Peyton also contributed 7 rebounds, 9 assists, and 4 steals. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, the Supersonics still were not able to win that game. They lost by a final score of 119 to 111. In his prime, Dwight Howard was the league's top interior defender and shot blocker. He was also an unstoppable force when he had the ball in the paint. But despite this, he is another legend that never scored 50 in a game. His career high came on April 16th, 2011 in a game against the Atlanta Hawks during his time with the Magic. Dwight opened this game with a strong 12 points in the first, making four of his six shots from the field and all four of his free throws. He then upped the ante in the second, scoring an incredible 19 points on just 10 shot attempts from the field. Howard entered halftime with 31 points, and it seemed that he was well on his way to his first 50-point game. However, he had a very quiet third quarter with Jameer Nelson stealing the show, scoring 20 points in the quarter, while Dwight only took two shots from the field and made one out of his six free throw attempts. He came back in the fourth, closing out the final quarter with another 12 points, and despite his 46-point and 19-rebound effort, the Magic still fell to Atlanta by 10, and Dwight's 8 turnovers and 5 fouls did not help Orlando's case. Now, throughout his prime, Scottie Pippen served as one of the greatest second options of all time alongside Michael Jordan. While Jordan was able to focus on scoring and playing his best defense, Pippen was forced to pick up the slack in almost every other aspect of the game. He played an extremely well-rounded style of basketball, being a very talented playmaker for his size in his era, a skilled rebounder, and one of the best defenders that the game had ever seen. However, even with him sharing an offense with Jordan, there were still some nights that he stole the show as a scorer. One of these games took place on February 18, 1997, when the Bulls took on the Nuggets. Scotty made it very clear from the start that he was going to heavily focus on offense, leading the team with 8 shot attempts in the first and turning that into 8 points. Despite sitting for nearly a fourth of the second quarter, which is pretty normal, Pippen was still able to put up another 8 points, finishing that half with 16. While he did have a respectable first half, Scotty turned up the heat in the second even more, scoring 18 in the third, shooting 6 for 7 from the field, 2 for 3 from 3, and 4 for 4 from the free throw line. Pippen missed only one shot in the fourth quarter as well, ending that quarter with 13 points on 5 of 6 shooting. When the final buzzer sounded that day, the Bulls secured a comfortable 134-123 win with Pippen ending that night with a career-high 47 points. Along with this, he also contributed 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals while shooting 70.4% from the field, 40% from 3, and 100% from the line. During his playing days, Mitch Richmond was one of the league's premier scorers. In his first decade in the league, he averaged 20 points per game or more every season with his career high coming in the 1996-97 season where he put up 25.9 points a game. Despite this, neither of his two career high scoring nights came in this season and despite his scoring prowess, he never scored 50 points in a game either. Richmond set his career high in points for the first time in his rookie season on March 4, 1989, against the Sacramento Kings during his time with the Golden State Warriors. Even with him sharing the offense with Chris Mullen, the rookie stole the show in this game. 
He made 17 of his 24 shot attempts from the field and also lived at the free throw line in this one, making 13 of his 19 attempts. He finished that game with a very impressive 47 points, 9 rebounds, 2 assists, and 2 steals. Along with this, Golden State secured a 12-point win, 155-143. to If Richmond would have made just 3 of those 6 missed free throws, we would not have him on this list, but here we are. Now, ironically, Richmond tied his career high over half a decade later when he was a part of the Kings. This happened on December 15, 1995, when Sacramento took on the Houston Rockets. Once again, this was a very efficient shooting night for Richmond, with him making 17 of his 29 shots from the field, 3 for 5 from 3, and 10 for 13 from the line. Mitch finished this night with 47 points, 6 rebounds, 7 assists, and 4 steals. Despite this incredible performance, once again, this was still a very tight game with the Kings only winning by 4 points, but they got the victory, that's all that matters. Now I want to turn back the clock to the 50s and the 60s to take a look at Paul Arizin's career. When a player is taken from the game at the peak of their efforts, it's always a sad thing to see. However, almost every time it's as a result of injuries. That wasn't the case for Arizin though. After leading the league with 25.4 points per game in the 1951-52 season, he missed the next two seasons to serve with the Marines. This is a very, very respectable thing to do, I must say. Despite averaging 25 plus points in multiple seasons, Arizin was never able to crack the 50 point mark though. His career high came on February 17, 1961, when his Philadelphia Warriors took on the Boston Celtics. Despite sharing an offense with Wilt Chamberlain, Arizin stole the show in this game. He finished this contest with 49 points while shooting 59.5% from the field and 83.3% from the free throw line. To make this even more impressive, he achieved this 49 point feat decades before the three point line was even a thing. Along with his 49 points, Arizin also contributed 10 rebounds and 4 assists. But despite this career night, the Warriors still fell to the Celtics by a final score of 133 to 128. Now I want to move on to a player that has been doing a lot for the Clippers in this current season. Paul George has had an extremely smooth game on the offensive end and one of the cleanest jump shots in the league for his entire NBA career. However, he shockingly also has never broken 50. He came extremely close and set his career high on December 5th, 2015, when he was still with the Indiana Pacers in a game against the Utah Jazz. George started this contest with a very strong 12 points in the first. While he was able to sink all six of his free throw attempts, he still wasn't shooting that great as he went just three for eight from the field. Despite playing for about four and a half minutes in the second, he was still able to score eight more points, making three out of his four shots from the field and cashing in on two three-point attempts. He entered halftime with a very strong 20 points, but he turned up the heat even more in the second, putting up another 25 while shooting 61.5% from the field and 71.4% from three. Despite sitting at 45 points, the Jazz forced this game into overtime, and George had a very quiet overtime, making only one three on his two shots, which is why he ultimately didn't end up hitting that 50-point mark. He finished this game with a career-high 48 points, 24 of them coming from behind the three-point line. Despite this, the Pacers were sent home with a tough three-point loss. During his playing days, Yao Ming was one of the most feared players in the paint that the game had ever seen. His 7'6", 310-pound build made him almost unguardable when he got the ball down low. As a result of this, it makes the fact that he's never scored 50 in a single game very surprising. His career high came on February 22nd, 2004 during his second season in the league when the Rockets took on the Hawks. Yao started off this game hot with 10 in the first quarter, making 4 out of his 5 shot attempts from the field and going 2 for 3 from the line. He finished the first half with a very efficient 16 points on just 9 shot attempts. Now Yao kept up the heat in the second half, scoring another 13 on only 6 shot attempts with him only playing 17 minutes. Despite Yao sitting at just 29 points, he wouldn't get off that easy as this game was forced into OT. He had a very quiet overtime period, making his only shot from the field. However, this game was still knotted up, and the second overtime still had to be played, where Yao scored another two points. In the third and final overtime period, he stepped up huge, scoring another eight points in the final five minutes. Yao finished this game with 41 points while only taking 21 shots from the field. He shot a very efficient 71.4% from the field and 84.6% from the line. 
Along with this, he contributed 16 boards, 7 assists, and 2 blocks. His career night and elite level of play in triple overtime wouldn't be for nothing either as the Rockets escaped with a 2-point win over the Hawks. Manu Ginobili was a part of the San Antonio Spurs legendary Big 3 that won 4 NBA titles and was a staple of their era. Ginobili played the role of the third man up perfectly and did whatever it took for his team to win. For him, this meant coming off the bench for a good chunk of his career, despite being arguably the team's most versatile scorer. However, when he set his career high on January 21st, 2005 against the Phoenix Suns, he served as the team's starting shooting guard and gave the league a game to remember. It was clear early into this game that Manu was destined for a special night, scoring 12 in the first. He followed this up with an additional 7 in the second, impressively doing this while only taking 2 shot attempts from the field. Ginobili led the Spurs throughout the third quarter with a solid 6 points, failing to convert though on either of his two 3-point attempts. However, he saved his best for last. In the fourth quarter, Manu put up 17 points, going 5 for 7 from the field and cashing in on all three of his 3-pointers. However, his 42 points in regulation was not enough to end this game, and it was forced into overtime. In 5 minutes, he finished his career night with 6 more points, putting his total at 48 while shooting 72.7% from the field, 71.4% from three, and 91.7% from the line. Along with this, he contributed five rebounds and six assists, which helped lead San Antonio to a close 128-123 to win. This was a very, very efficient performance from Manu. Now, John Stockton was a player who defined the 90s and one of the best pure point guards that the game had ever seen. He was arguably the best passer of all time, but also a very pesky perimeter defender, holding the all-time records in both assists and steals. But while he left most of the scoring to Carl Malone, Stockton could get buckets when he wanted to. He set his career high on May 2nd, 1989 in a closeout game against the Golden State Warriors. The Utah Jazz found themselves down 2-0, facing elimination in the first round of the playoffs. Stockton was determined, though, not to let their season end, and did everything in his power to make sure that did not happen. He finished this game with 34 points, 16 assists, and 6 steals, while shooting 65% from the field, 50% from 3, and 87.5% from the charity stripe. Despite his career night, the Jazz still took a crushing 120-106 to loss and were sent home in just 3 games. Now, The following season, Stockton once again tied his career high, this time against the Sacramento Kings, on March 17, 1990. Shockingly, Stockton had nearly the exact same game to his performance against the Warriors the year prior. Not only did he match his career high of 34 points, but he also had 16 assists and 6 steals yet again, the exact same stat line that he had against Golden State. However, he shot a little less efficient against the Kings, going 63.6% .6 from the field, missing two threes, and shot 66.7% from the line. Once again, the Jazz suffered a loss in this one by a score of 122-109. to On to a player that had a very similar play style to John Stockton, Jason Kidd was another elite passer, currently sitting in second place all-time in assists, and was also an incredible perimeter defender, ranking second in all-time steals as well. Despite these being the most two prominent areas of his game, Kidd was still a great scorer when he needed to be. He proved this during his time with the Phoenix Suns on March 29, 2001 in a game against the Rockets. He came out of the gates a bit slow, but still put up a solid 7 points, shooting 3 for 7 from the field and 1 for 3 from 3. Kidd went into halftime with 15 points, but then turned up the heat in the second, coming out of the locker room scoring 10 points in the third on much more efficient shooting splits. He saved his best for last and exploded in the fourth with 18 points. Kidd finished that game with 43 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, and 4 steals while shooting 47.1% from the field, 45.5% from 3, and 75% from the line. He willed the Suns to a 90-85 win, contributing nearly half of the team's total points by himself. Rounding out this list, I want to take a look at another great point guard. Isaiah Thomas was widely known for his play as a pure point guard, facilitating for his teammates on offense and playing an ultra-aggressive brand of defense on the other end of the court. However, Thomas had an elite ability to score as he put this on full display on December 13, 1983, when the Pistons took on the Nuggets. 
Around this time, the Nuggets played with the mindset of scoring as many points as possible and not really putting too much emphasis on defense. This meant playing the game at an extremely high pace in hopes that their opponent was not going to be able to keep up. But that plan ultimately backfired and Thomas proved that he was more than capable of matching the Nuggets' unique style of play. He finished that game playing 52 minutes in this triple overtime thriller. When this final whistle sounded, Thomas finished the game with 47 points, 5 rebounds, an incredible 17 assists, and 4 steals while shooting 52.9% from the field, 50% from 3, and making 10 of his 19 free throw attempts. This is once again, another situation, gotta be more efficient from the free throw line, and then he easily would have cracked 50, but guess it was not meant to be. Now, like always, guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a thumbs up. If you want to see a part three, let me know in the comments section down below and hit that subscribe button. I will catch you in the next one.